I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Frank McKenna, who is the chief architect for Open Seas, but also uh, one of the early uh, users and developers in high performance parallel processing in the field of structural and geotechnical engineering. Frank. Thank you, Professor. So my talk today is titled Computational Simulation. So um, I'm going to talk about three things. Basically, I'm going to show what sort of simulation people are currently doing within PEER. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about open seas. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about sort of where technology is going and um, if we're going to keep using technology, how we're going to have to change to move along with it. So to say current simulation examples, um, examples that are going on within PEER right now, um, for the ATC78 project, Professor Maley and one of his students, Panos, is working on an older um, concrete building. Um, they're having to model the exterior moment frame. We're looking at sort of shear failure in, in the models. Um, Professor Algamal at UC San Diego is looking at sort of the effects of enlarged pile groups. So they're modeling bridges. Um, they're including the soils in their models and what, what, what's happening to the piles in the models. Um, Prof Professor Masal in UC Berkeley is looking at sort of unreinforced um, old masonry structures. Um, what happens in collapse? Um, these panels, the, the masonry panels, like falling out of the building, looking at the, the failure of the structure. Um, Pedro Arduino, he's doing lots and lots of interesting stuff. We could spend a whole presentation just what Pedro's up to. Um, first example, I'm showing a, a sheet pile wall. Um, basically, you put, you, 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 uh, in, you put in your, pot, your sheet pile, and then you start removing the soil elements from the model and showing what happens. Um, finally, um, Pedro's looking at some examples of simulations, of, uh, comparing simulation versus the actual recorded results. Um, this is an example of some bridges. Um, under a centrifuge test at San Diego. Um, basically, he's comparing the, so the response at the top of the, the bridge bends and the, the moments in the piles in the model, seeing that there's, you know, there's good correlation between the simulation results and the experimental results. Um, future kind of structural systems. Um, Professor Berkeley, Marios, is looking at you know, these future structures, which you know, they don't resemble any of your, the, top of the structures that are sort of built today. Um, we've got seismic isolators, viscous dampers, and lots of things going on inside the structure. Um, so how do we model that in, in, in using our simulation tools? Finally, again, Professor Elgamal from San Diego, he's, he's created what's called Open Seas PDE, um, which is a, a tool for performance-based earthquake engineering of, of bridges. Um, so that's kind of really quickly what sort of simulation, types of simulation people are doing. Um, now I'm going to spend the next brief part of the talk talking about open seas. Um, most of those examples I've shown on the previous slides were actually done using the open seas program. Um, open seas has been under development by peers since 1998. Nice has supported its maintenance of open seas since 2003. Um, Open Seas is software for both structural and geotechnical engineers. It's something that sets it apart from the, the typical finite element tools, say, for PORM, PERFORM. Um, it has a large group of developers and even larger group of users. It's open source and royalty free, which is pr pretty much why we have so many users, because it's free to use. Um, if anybody wishes to include open seas in code that they sell, they actually have to obtain um, a license from the UC office for it. But apart from that, it's, it's free to, for anybody else to use. Um, so what were the original goals of open seas? When we started open seas, what was, um, why were we doing this? I remember the first peer meeting um, presentation I gave, somebody asked, well, why another um, finite element analysis tool? Why do we need another one? Why can't we just use drain or feed? Um, and the reasons were threefold. Um, basically, we wanted to create a new, a new platform that would use current um, software enge engineering ideas in the creation of this new package. We also wanted something that was going to be used for both the geotechs and the structural engineers, something, some common platform that they could, both could use. Um, 
And then for peer, within peer, we wanted a common framework where all the students or all the faculty members would be using the same platform so they could share. If somebody was developing an element at San Diego, they could share the code with somebody um, doing some research in, um, at San Diego or Berkeley or Stanford. And finally, we also wanted to ensure that the research actually got out to, to industry. Um, in the past, up until open seas, um, commercial companies had to um, find out about new ele element routines or new material routines just reading papers. Um, and then they'd read the paper, see the theory, and then program the theory. Uh, what we helped with open seas was by showing the code, allowing people to just download the code directly, um, that there would be a much faster uptake of new research. So those are the goals. Um, before I go into a little bit about the design of open seas, let me tell you what I think a computational sim simulation is. Um, most people think of computational simulation um, of, of, it's just about models and elements. What sort of elements does this package have? How do I model um, to model my structure? Um, I don't think of structural engineering like that at all. Structural analysis, there's a lot more stuff in this structural analysis package. Um, that stuff includes stuff for doing the, the equation solving, AX equals B. Um, there's stuff for visualizing what the data look like or what the deformed shape of your structure is or just you know, where the results are stored. How are they stored? And if you combine all the things, if you, um, if we felt that if the tool opened up everything to the engineer to play with, they'd have a much more powerful package than just um, straightforward elements and materials. And the whole thing, the base of our bridge, it's built in hardware. At the end of my talk, I'm going to be talking a lot about hardware because hardware right now is changing drastically. Um, and most simulation software is just not able to keep up with the changes to hardware. Um, and as the years progress, the next five, ten years, they're going to be left so far behind unless they fundamentally start changing the way we start doing our simulations. So the Open Seas classes. Um, Open Seas basically was designed to be very modular. Um, we wanted it so that if, if somebody wanted to, say, create a new system, a new solver, they could quickly add it to the program without having to know the guts of the program. So it's a very modular design. You're only constant, worried about one particular part that you're interested in, like an element or a material. Um, so there's a, basically a number of modules we put in. One, the basic finite element code. There was another module for parallel processing and a final module for basic reliability and sensitivity analysis. Um, currently, there's over a 1,000 different modules or classes in OpenSeas. Um, most of these classes are not provided by me. They've been um, provided by members of the community um, from all over the place. I'm only showing a couple of examples of some of the stuff that has come in from different people. A lot of materials, a lot of elements, some integration strategies, and some solution algorithms. Um, basically, the so the newest element I'm showing here is the triple friction pendulum bearing. Um, it's come from UC Berkeley. One of the older elements is an element for um, the, re the joints in a reinforced concrete building. Um, we're not done. There's still a lot more stuff that OpenSeas cannot model. Um, we're constantly looking for new elements and materials. Um, but there are other things, too. Um, we need new solvers, integration screens, and solution algorithms. For example, the, finite, the most finite element codes, the internal guts of doing the nonlinear solution algorithm is newton raphson newton raphson in theory, um, if you look at the, the numeric stuff, it only works for a real smooth um, system. We don't have that. Our, our, our surfaces are closer to this when you start thinking about you know, rebar breaking and cracks opening up. Um, so everybody's using newton raphson but it's really not, it's not all that suitable. There are other alternatives out there. Um, recently there's a paper out of MIT um, where for other, other areas of finite element codes, they've taken surfaces, you know, they have similar surfaces to us and they've turned this surface into a nice bowl. And then the solution of the bowl, it's, it's really easy to get. So they transform this in, into a bowl and find the solution to the bowl. It's, it's very easy to do. Um, so we just need people, graduate students, to, you know, can this concept 
be applied to structural engineering if it can. Um, if you want to, you know, work on the routines, um, test it out. You know, we give you the open seats framework to play with. We've got all the elements and materials you can play with. Um, you can go test out your new so your new solution algorithm to see see if it works. Um, so as I say, we can't do this alone. Um, we need contributions from other people. I take contributions in any forms, uh, any programming language. Um, I even take stuff in MATLAB and will convert it into into the correct format. Um, so has 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 it worked? Has OpenSeas worked? Um, I would say it has. Um, in the last six years, OpenSeas has been downloaded over 38,000 times um, by 120 different countries. If I'm just looking, looking at the hits to the message to the basically to the OpenSeas website in the last year, um, there's been a lot, and they're basically coming from every country in the world. Um, it's like over 160,000 visits to the to the website from different people. Um, most of those visits do come from the United States. Over 50% are coming from the United States. Well, not quite 50%, but a thir over a third. Um, and then in, within the United States, it's pretty much every state with California um, dominating. Um, um, so has have, have been disseminating the, the research? Has OpenSea's gone and been used in practice? Or have the, have the materials or the new elements appeared in commercial finite element codes. Um, so why is OpenSeas used in practice? Um, well, we do have routines that are not yet currently available in the commercial codes. Um, as users start using them, and they say, well, then we really like this new concrete material, the commercial codes will come along and say, well, if everybody's using this concrete material, at some point we're going to have to implement it. So we're hoping that, you know, these new routines and that students have written will actually make it into the commercial codes. Um, another reason it's starting to be used in practice is graduate students, they, as I say, they learn to love it. Um, you know, there is, there is an initial learning curve with open seas, and it takes a lot of graduate students a lot of time to, to figure out how to use it. But once they use, learn how to use it, they all love to use it. Um, and finally, it's very fast. Um, so I'm just showing now quick uh, examples of you know where it's been used in industry. Um, I have friends in industry, so they've been providing the, these slides. So this one's coming from Dagen Kolb engineers, Sylvia Mazzoni and Dagen Kolb. Um, so basically, they're doing. They wanted to. They had this building, and they wanted to do um, multi-support excitations basically on the building. The program they're using, Perform, can actually do multi-support excitations. Um, so they basically take the Perform model. Um, they've wrote a little script which will take the, out, the input file from performance, create a, an input file from OpenSeas, and then they just run OpenSeas um, with the, the multi-supports. Sylvie again, um, basically doing, um, creating a little routine which would do inelastic, um, an elastic spectra for the ground motion scaling. And here's another one where basically we're validating the, they're validating, you know, how good are the simulation tools? So here we're showing the experimental versus the analytical results for a, for a building, for the ATC83 project. Finally, another engineer, um, he's actually from Rutherford and Shaquin. Um, these are solar, solar panels on a building. Um, they're not actually tied to the building. They wanted to see if the solar panels would you know, slide off the building and sort of under wind or earthquakes. Um, so basically, they ran this on SAP 2000. It was taking 80, 80, 80 hours for five seconds, and it was just taking way too long. Um, they actually needed to go up to 10 seconds. So what they did is, let's, you know, they stopped it, um, quickly created an input file for OpenSeas, and then they ran the full 10 seconds in, in 90 minutes. It's basically a, you know, 10 to 1 savings, just by changing from the perform to the OpenSeas and using an appropriate solver that was available in OpenSeas. So we have a lot of users. Um, so with success, we do have problems. We have to um, help the users. Um, so we do that in a number of ways. Um, the first is yearly. We have a workshop um, which we you know, explain to new users how to use OpenSeas. We record the rec we record those workshops, and that material is made available online through either Peer or NICE. Um, we have a very active message board where people daily. 
posed many interesting questions on how do you model something or I'm having problems with my model, what's the, the problem with it? Um, so we, we spend a lot of our time answering these questions. Um, and we're hoping as the community gets more of a community spirit that it won't be just um, see myself and my colleagues answering these questions. As people, you know, we get more of a community spirit going that other people will start answering questions. Um, some people are, most people don't. And finally, new in 2011, we started a, basically a web-based seminar once a month. We'll have a topic of uh, Open Seas related. We'll show people how to use Open Seas or how to model an advanced feature in Open Seas. That's actually, we've only had two and they're actually proving wildly successful. Um, the last one was held this week and we've had almost 200 attendees from around the world um, sitting in and listening and watching as the, as the, as the presenter goes through you know, modeling in Open Seas. Um, so this slide is basically to just to say that you know it doesn't just have to be open seas. Um, technology is such right now that simulation platforms can be talking to each other. You can be doing if you have your favorite concrete wall model in one simulation application and your favorite beam column model in another application. You could be doing a finite element analysis where both simulation programs are actually talking together to actually get the simulation done. Um, so there's been a tool, OpenFresco is actually created for hybrid simulation, but this tool has been extended to allow people to do this. Um, it's available for both, op so you know, OpenSeas, LS, Steina, Abacus, and An Ansys, you know, those four different programs could actually be, be talking together during a simulation. Um, and of course, it doesn't have to stop there. Um, if you think about it, you could actually do multi-scale um, analysis where you get into almost, you know, parts of the structure, say your column joint could be you can almost go down to the nanoscale if you want to, modeling what's going on in the joint there, and then just bringing the results back up. So how good are simulations? You've, I believe you've seen this slide this morning. Um, we're spending all this time creating this simulation tool with all these great features, so how, you know, how, how, how good are they? Um, you saw the results this morning, not, not very good. Um, um, we knew the exact motion that was going into this concrete column. Um, predictions were all over the place. Um, and these predictions are, you know, there's, there's probably two reasons for these, some of these predictions being so poorly. Some are just people, some people just cannot model. Or <laughs> <laughs> and then the other reason is we're dealing with materials um, that are not, you know, there's uncertainty in our materials and they're just not being captured when, in, in the models. Um, so when I'm talking about our predictions must include measures of uncertainty. I'm not just talking about taking one model and running, you know, seven or eight ground motions to it to get, you know, what's the, what's the variation going to be in our response. Um, I would say there, the uncertainty, there's, you know, there's, there's uncertainty in our materials too. This is grade A36 steel. Um, most people doing a nonlinear analysis with A36 steel will just assume that it yields at 36 KSI. If you look at the, you know, the, here's, here's a plot of the, the steel, companies took of, you know, tests of, for, for the yield strength. As you see, they go from 36 up to over 70 KSI. Um, what value do you use when you create a, a single model with one FY? There isn't, there isn't one. Um, so here's two quotes I'll, I'll hit you with. Um, basically, the first one from Jeffrey's, a book in 1967. Um, the last part, you know, an estimate without a standard error is practically meaningless. Okay, so our you know, single simulations are, um, he's saying they're all, you know, they're practically meaningless. We do not include the uncertainty in our, in our, in our answer. Um, if you don't believe mathematicians know what they're talking about, um, here's something from Tinsley Oden um, and, and some others. Um, basically saying that you have to include um, measures of uncertainty in the, in the results. You know, we have to know how good the predictions are. And he's not just talking about structural engineering. We're not the only group that has this problem. Um, he's actually talking, he's, does this, you know, weather um, in the defense industry, they all have uncertainty in their models and none of them are really um, modeling it. They're all beginning to, nobody's really started. So Open Seas, we, you know, we had this module for reliability analysis. Um, here's an example of the sort of stuff you can do. You can calculate the uncertainty. Well, this was a peer project where they count the uncertainty in, in the, the displacement and how sensitive was the, the model to certain input parameters. 
Um, now I say, you know, OpenSeas is useful, but most um, practicing engineers don't wouldn't be using OpenSeas. Um, there is another toolkit available at a Sandia National Lab. It's called Dakota, which will pretty much do the same kind of stuff that OpenSeas does. Um, it's a very useful package. Um, it does run on sort of high-performance computers. Um, but if you're thinking about dealing with uncertainty and you don't want to use OpenSeas, you might want to have a look at the Dakota. So the generation, if you, um, the uncertainty quantification actually requires much more computation than a single analysis, which is probably why people don't use it. Um, I don't want to offend any, but I would argue that if your desktop computer represented the state of the art, um, you're pretty much only using a slide rule to do your c calculations. A slide rule is probably a little bit of an exaggeration. It's probably more like a, a pocket calculator. Um, next year it will be a slide rule. And if I'm giving this talk again in two years, it's basically you're playing with an abacus um, to do your calculations. Um, technology is changing, and it's changing drast you know, dramatically at the moment. Um, here's a, a quick plot. Um, basically, I'm showing what happened. Basically, back in 2000, um, they hit a wall. The chip makers hit a wall. They couldn't make the chips go any faster. Um, so I'm showing here on the right, basically, here's the Intel. This is the latest spec. I got this last night from their, from their, from their website. These are the, how they're fast. They're, these are their fastest um, chips. These are the gigaflops that they run at. Um, the Xeon server is a, it's a 12 core machine. As you see, you know, my child's game has more computational power than, than the most expensive Intel chip. Um, trends in parallel computing. Um, basically, hardware is changing drastically. Um, Software systems, we basically, we haven't been changing to keep up with changes in technology. Up until, you know, the last couple of years, um, the compilers that the simulation, that the applications are built with are able to overcome this problem. Not anymore. Um, the compilers cannot take care of the, the, um, the way machines are going. Um, right now, um, the fastest high-performance computers in the world they have like 300,000 processors available to them. Um, by 2018, when we hit the, the exaflop computer, that's expected to have somewhere between 10 million and 100 million processors in the machine. Um, this slide here is from Jack Dungara. Basically, what he's pointing out, the fastest computer in the world stays in, the, say, what's called the top 500 list for about 10 years. Um, it takes about, about eight years. It takes about 10 years for... Um, the technology to make it so that your, your laptop is equal to the slowest computer. So basically, in 15 years, um, what he's saying is that in 15 years' time, I'm going to have a machine that will have 300,000 processors. Okay? So how are our simulation tools going to be able to take care of machines with up to 300,000 processors? Um, so another thing that's going on right now, cloud computing is pretty much taking over. Since two, early 2000s, um, everything's been about getting their applications on the cloud. Um, so according to Steve Jobs, it's not um, Professor Mahan here, um, the PC has been now demoted. Your desktop computer is no longer a um, superior being. It's now just, it's just not like another, it's like your phone or your iPad. Um, everything's now being done in the cloud. The cloud, so most people think the cloud is just a big, great, great big hard disk in the sky. It's actually not. Um, so what cloud computing is, is internet-based computing, whereby computing resources and storage um, are accessed on demand by the users. If a um, engineering company in San Francisco wanted to do 300,000 analysis runs, it at any time could go to some point to get, give me access to Go to like Microsoft Azure or Amazon EC2. Give me, I want to run 300,000 analysis on your computers. Go off and do it. So that's what cloud computing is going to do. Um, but before we get all excited about all these, you know, 10 million, 100 million processors, there's something called Amdel's law. Um, 
Amdoli basically, you know, what we care about is how much faster it's going to go on a parallel computer than your single computer. So Amdoli broke down well the if the parallel computation, if so much of it is, can only be done sequentially, and the rest of it can be done in parallel, there's a simple formula which will show um, what the relationship is as the number of processors goes towards infinity. And basically, it said, it said if 10% um, if of the job has to be done sequentially, i.e., it cannot be done in parallel, um, no matter how many processors you have, you're only getting a speed up of 10. Okay? So even though I've got 100 million processors, I'm only going to go 10 times faster than running it on a single job. So the goal, the idea here is that we can't, we have to really think about what sort of, um, how can we put as much parallelization into our programs as we can? How can we make as much of this stuff go in parallel as possible? Um, so I'll quickly start skipping through some slides if I'm running out of time. Um, Here's the example, OpenSeas, we did have that parallel module. Um, I'm just showing two examples here. One's a large model. Uh, well, both are large models. One using is a implicit time integration scheme with a direct solver. And you see, we're only going up to about 16 processors before we really don't get any performance improvements. If we actually change that from an implicit with a direct solver to an explicit integration scheme with a, 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 a diagonal solver, we can actually go up to um, scale up to 6,000 processors. Um, this one was 73 million degrees of freedom. Um, but most of the for the stuff for the performance-based earthquake engineering, we're dealing with you know large numbers of of simulations. Hopefully, um, we have another application it allows people to quickly just you know, by adding a couple of lines of code into their scripts, they can make their runs in parallel. Um, Here's an example. We saved a girl um, basically 10, 10 days' worth of work. She was able to do in 15 minutes. Here's another example where something that would have taken two months is actually done in five hours. Or here's one. You know, This one just came in from San Diego. Um, we'll be talking about it more tomorrow in the simulation section. But something that would have taken 12 years on the open science grid, which is basically uh, it's like cloud computing, he was actually able to do this in 30 days, one month, uh, did 12 years' worth of work. Just by running, it's just running these, you know, many, many simulations um, in the cloud. Um, so quickly, you know, OpenSeas is available in the club, cloud through Nice Hub. Um, there are tools there for submitting scripts, um, education, and, and for practicing engineers to use. Um, so very quickly, here's one little tool example where we're allowing users to submit, you know, these 10,000, 100,000 simulations um, on the open science grid using this tool. You provide the input file, you provide, say, the list of motions, what scale factors you want, or um, the list of FY, and it will run all the possible combinations of those and leave the results for you on, on your, on your, on, on these for you to download later. Um, example of a little tool, this is lateral pile analysis. It allows you to play graphically with the, with the, to show you the effects. Um, site response analysis, little tool for doing site response analysis, where you provide the input at the base of your, at your soil column, and it will actually determine what the response is at the top of the soil column. Um, so this pretty much does what um, Shake, ProShake or ProShake NL will do. Um, it's freely available. Um, and this, the person who actually, this actually tool was actually the, it won actually the Open Seas Challenge for 2011. I gave away an iPad, or an iPod. For 2012, I'm announcing now that I'm going to give away another iPod to some lucky student. Um, all they have to do is write an Open Seas powered app um, and place it on Nice Hub. Um, quickly, you know, where's simulation going? Um, well, simulation has to be a, in the future, has to be, you know, we're going to be doing simulation. It's got to be validated by experimentation. There is a coupling between simulation and experimentation. Um, and finally, we've got to start using the tools um, the technology provides us. For example, tools provided by NISUB to actually make use of the technology. Um, so here's one possible future I'm showing. We're basically the engineer. He's just providing his drawings to some program. 
you know, he doesn't actually provide the model. And remember, I'm taking the, the engineer out of the loop. Um, they don't have to do any more modeling if, they, if they, they don't want to. And what the software will do is it'll go off to a database and say, okay, for this, for this building, give me, or for this, for this structure I want to do, give me sort of the best elements and materials that are currently available. Um, you know, based on, say, the location of the building, it'll go off to a database and, you know, give me the ground motions I should be using for this building. Or, you know, any adjacent structures if we want to do soil structure, soil structure interaction. Um, the results come to the database and they get us sent off to the building inspector. Uh, the building department likes it. They submit the drawings back to the, to the federal database for, you know, for other building owners to look at later. Um, I would say sort of the database, where do we get the, the results? You know, this, the, the balance of experimentation and simulation. And we're not just drawing in the results, say all the results are, say, in Nice or Peer. You know, everybody's got their database of, you know, experimental results. So can we harness them all together? If I'm looking for the yield strength of steel, can I look at sort of tests that have been done at Berkeley or, or Tongji or um, eDefense to get the results? Um, what this will allow is, say, Niherk wants to do a, you know, an earthquake scenario. Um, given that, you know, for the current, you know, LA, what's what's going to happen in, in, in this um, earthquake scenario? It actually be able to actually use the, you know, the buildings that are already, the, you know, in the database. Um, what's more, it'll be able to, you know, if, if experimentation comes along later and finds that, well, these models actually don't work very well. You know, there's there's better mod, you know. The database will evolve as time goes on, so you know they'll actually be able to find. You know, there's, if there's a problem in a building, um, and years could go by, you know, years later they'll be able to say, well, you know, this is the building. This this is the model for this building. It currently, you know, it's curr we'll show now that it currently fails. Um, one other idea is, you know, the USGS to say it detects that there's an earthquake coming. Um, it can go to the database, so to, to get the buildings. It does a back calculation of the fault scenario. Um, those are the sort of the, the rapture to rafters kind of analysis. And instead of sending a text message to somebody saying that there's an earthquake plumbing, we actually calculate, you know, what's the damage you are going to be in the different buildings. And appropriate buildings might get a message, you know, you know set off, it might set off an alarm in a building, you know, the earthquake alarm in the building gets set off. Um, so there is a simulation session meeting tomorrow, 1 to 1, 3.30 in Boiler Room B. Any questions? No, good. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Can you comment on the QA QC QC program of the Solomon States and they have the industry access provided? Um if you come along, I could ask Michael Scott to uh, comment on that better tomorrow, but um the, the um, reliability part of the code is actually, um, it's not being used a lot um, by outside people. Um, it's used a lot by the, actually the researchers who actually develop the code. They're using it to write their papers, to do their, um, and they're like, they'll, they will be comparing it against, say, something that, like a Dakota or so, like a MATLAB script will get, and they're getting the same results. But for the full, you know, for every possible, Sort of open seas model. How does the you know? There's a little bit of stuff that goes on internally um, that's kind of element to material dependent. So for the examples they've used and the materials and the elements that they've used, you know, it works. Um, for other um, elements and materials, uh, I'm gonna, I can stand up here and say that it's, it's always going to work. The person to your left is that Joel Conte? Yes. He's he's the person. He's one of the people to ask. <laughs> As you know, that, that's, that code is actually, you know, he, he works a great deal with it. Um, so the question might be better directed towards Joel. Another question, perhaps. Well, I think we have a lot of uh, food for thought and uh, discussion, uh, maybe in a lively session tomorrow, uh, as uh, Frank had indicated up here as well. So thank you, Frank.